Okay, everyone, according to my clock, it is now six o'clock. So we will call this meeting to order our first regular meeting of 2021, if you can believe it. Um, first up, we have public input. And I see a number of people are in our gallery. And I think a number of them are here to talk about the arts plan, which is a delegation. But if anyone wants to uh, talk about something else, they should put up their little hand and now would be a good time. And let's see, okay, so Sue has her hand up and our hostess, Rachel, will allow her to speak. As soon as that works, we'll, we'll go. Okay, it looks like you're ready, Sue. So you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, well, great. Uh, Hi, uh, so I have timed this, so I'll tell you when to start, start the timer, okay? <laughs> Okay, you've got two minutes. Thank you for being considered. Right. So hello, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Sue Wrigley. I'm a resident of Rossland and a volunteer wildlife rescuer for a number of rehabilitation facilities in BC. There's a proposal being put forward today to Council for approval so that it can go to AK AKBLG and then hopefully to UBCM. This proposal is asking for consistency and processes for getting wildlife to rehabilitation facilities when the animal is eligible for rehab. So a little bit of background, conservation officer or CO training consists of four months of formal training and then a year of on the job or field training under a supervisor. The formal training that four months does not include anything about rehabilitation options for wildlife. They may get training about rehab options during their field training, but that is entirely up to the supervisor and seems to depend on the supervisor's experience with rehab operations and their own opinions. As an example, I've talked to a new CO and a CO with many years of experience both of who had no awareness of a new wildlife rehab facility in Golden. They got their permit about two years ago. So there are concrete guidelines about what animals can be uh, rehabbed that are eligible for rehab. A couple of examples are bear cubs must be cubs of the year. Wolves and cougars as apex predators cannot be rehabbed. Different rehab facilities have different government permits, which govern what animals and how many of each species they can house. We're not debating those. None of those guidelines or permits, we're not debating those. The guidelines we want to see consistency across the province for is training about what rehab facilities exist, who the certified volunteers in their area are and why we are certified, who the CO can call for help with getting an animal to rehab, an awareness of the transport facilities that we have in place to get animals to rehab, and also who the rehab facility itself can call to get approval to capture or transport an animal. For example, over Christmas or other holidays, when there are limited CO resources, it can be very difficult to reach a CO. There are backup processes that can be used to get approval, but there's been confusion and lots of back and forth trying to find the right person, all the while the animal's at risk of dying from starvation or predation or becoming habituated and then ineligible for rehab. So all COs and government wildlife biologists need to know what these processes or backup processes are. Um, you may know that this proposal passed through Ross and Council in 2019 and went to AKBLG, but did not pass. There was a misunderstanding about what we were trying to do. So I'm trying to clear that up this time with education for each council involved in the um, AKBLG. So I won't be just speaking to you guys. That's it, should be under two minutes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sue. That's that's great. And um, it looks like we have other people in the gallery there. Does anyone else wish to speak to something that is not part of a delegation? If you do, raise your little hand, little blue hand. Okay, I don't see any other blue hands going up. So what I'd like to do is a motion to adopt the agenda. And I want to move a couple of things. I'd like to move Janice's motion um, that's in um, that that's in members' reports to put that up um, when we talk about uh, the report on the community groups, and I'd also like to move the 100% renewable um, plan adoption. That's at 8C. I'd like to move that up, and also this Red wildlife resolution 10A, so we can have all of those move up to 6A um, in in that order. If that's all right. With that, can I get a mover and a seconder? Okay, Terry moves it, Andy seconds it. Okay, any discussion on the agenda as amended? All in favor? Okay, good, thanks guys. All right, now we have two uh, delegations tonight. Two very interesting groups are here to talk to us. First one is Art Matters. And there's lots of Art Matters folks on the, uh, on the uh, guest list there. So whoever is the speaker, put your little blue hand up and we'll get you going. 
It looks like it's going to be Sarah. Is Sarah able to speak, Rachel? Looks like she should be almost. We just wait here a second. They just need to unmute themselves. Oh, okay. Sarah, are you are you muted on your end? Doesn't show she's muted what I'm looking at, but Sarah, speak when you can. Things have changed now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, my whole screen just changed. Oh. Rachel's making stuff happen. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> that was very exciting. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome to you and to the whole Arts Matters group. Oh, we even get to see you. There you are. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> oh, okay, so uh, my name is Sarah Takuma, and I've been invited by the Arts Matters group to introduce the new Rossland Arts Plan to you. Uh, as a member of the Rossland Arts Center Society, I was part of the steering group for this plan, and I believe that this plan is a useful guiding document for ensuring the continued support of the arts in Rossland. My job here is twofold. First, on behalf of the Arts Matters group, I'd like to thank the Council for their financial support in the development of this plan and for your participation in the development process. Second, I'd like to present the plan to you, the Rossland City Council, for your acknowledgement and with the request for this plan to be forwarded to the OCP Advisory Committee. The aim is to ensure that the arts are recognized and incorporated into the new Rossland OCP. The value of the arts, be it social, cultural, or economic, is widely recognized, and examples are listed in the Arts Plan cover letter, as well as in the Arts Plan itself. Communities like ours, Nelson and Fernie, for example, of arts plans in place which have benefited the whole community. In recognizing the value of the arts in communities, a group of arts organizations, artists, and businesses came together in 2019 with a shared interest in building a sustainable arts community in Rossland. This Arts Matters group led a grassroots engagement process to gain insights into Rossland's arts sector. This community engagement process involved a range of stakeholders, including artists, arts and culture organizations, and businesses, residents, council representatives, and other nonprofit and commercial key players. The Rossland Arts Plan is based on the thoughtful and passionate feedback from the community-based engagement process and was endorsed by the steering group members and their organizations. This plan was created with the intention to guide Rossland's creative sector in realizing its shared goals of providing accessible, diverse, and inclusive participation in the arts. It is a framework for building a resilient arts community through strong and representative leadership, accessing resources, and developing partnerships to create new opportunities for growth. It will be communicated to the community through arts organizations and other stakeholders, and will move forward to the formation of a new representative community arts collective. The arts collective will provide leadership, promote collaboration within the arts sector, and will oversee the delivery of the arts plan goals. A copy of the arts plan is in your council package, and we thank you for your support and for your consideration of this plan. If you have any questions, I will refer to you to the members of the Arts Matters group who are also in this delegation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sarah. That was that was great. We really enjoyed seeing this plan. And I do have to say, I'm, I'm really happy to see the collaboration. I know there were a lot of different groups in the community that came together on this. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, so I wanna ask council, does anyone have any questions for the arts group that is here tonight? If you do, unmute yourself. So, and while we're thinking, if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm going to say usually when we get a request, we respond at, at the next council meeting. But the timing for this is really great because we have our OCP advisory group is meeting. So I would like to, if there's no questions, I would like to ask council for a motion that we direct staff to share the arts plan and all the backup reports that you submitted with it with the OCP AC. Do I have a mover for that? Okay, Andy, I'll make that. Andy yep. makes the motion. Chris seconds it. Can Any I uh, can I comment on this? Just just yeah. uh, not a not a specific question, but I just want to say how impressed I am by this proposal and this report. And as as Kathy Marimura pointed out, the collaboration that seems to be done. It uh, you know I, I I've been around Rosin long enough to to realize the challenges of the arts community. 
um, certainly, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and it was volunteer driven then, or back then as it is now, but just so much more energy going into it now. And uh, hopefully that will, that will be actual people coming forward and, and making the commitments to see, to see their plans through. So just, just kudos to all the people involved. It was, a, it seems to be a tremendous effort. It's very impressive. That's great. Okay, anyone else have any comments on this or I will call the question and thank you for all the hard work. All in favor? Okay, no one opposed. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks to all the uh, Arts arts Matters members who are on the call. That's great, really appreciate it. Okay, next up, we have another delegation. This is for the RDKB Housing Needs Report, and we have Jada Bassey with us here. Let's see if she gets kicked off. <laughs> that seems to be happening. Just come back if you do. <laughs> Hi there, thank you. No, that worked uh, perfectly fine. So I think, um, Rachel, you're going to uh, allow me to share my screen. I think it's still disabled at this time. Um, okay. All right, so I guess we'll get started. Um, Rachel, am I able to have controls over this or are you going to, sorry, I just wasn't sure. Um, I will need to at this point in time. Okay, great. All right, well, good evening, um, your worship and council. My name is Jada Bassi, uh, and I'm with City Spaces Consulting, and I was the uh, project manager and led the process on behalf of the Regional District of Kootenai Boundary of preparing a regional housing needs assessment. Uh, so today we're gonna cover the purpose and process of the needs assessment, uh, share with you key findings from the regional level, um, share with findings from the city of Rosslyn uh, specific context. Uh, I'll conclude with some comments and then answer any questions that you have. Great, purpose and process. So the purpose of a housing needs assessment is to identify populations most challenged to find and afford housing in the local market, including housing gaps and other housing issues. And by, um, Populations, I just wonder if you can go back. It wasn't, wasn't quite ready there. Thanks, Rachel. Um, by, by populations, what I mean by that is um, households such as seniors, uh, families, uh, the workforce, for example, seasonal workers. Uh, by housing gaps, I, I mean um, tenure such as rental or home ownership or affordable housing. And by other housing issues, that can include um, supporting infrastructure that is needed to ensure um, uh, housing is uh, secured and maintained. So things like health and housing and health and um, housing and transportation. And also if there's any major new development projects in a community like a housing or a, a hospital expansion that could drive demand for more people and also more housing. All right, next slide. So the process started with background research, um, baseline data. So that's the key indicators required uh, through legislative requirements. We undertook extensive consultation regionally. So that included key informant interviews and a broader consultation um, process. Um, and we prepared two key deliverables. One's a consultation summary report. Uh, and that includes um, what we heard from everyone in the region, but also has a specific profile on what we heard from Rossland community members. And the final housing needs report uh, similarly has findings from a regional perspective and also specific to each community. So there is a profile on just the Rossland specific housing context. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the community engagement uh, to give a, a bit of a flavor of who we all engaged with. So we had 738 people who responded to the survey, and that was during when COVID-19 was um, just disrupting our lives. So we were pretty pleased with getting that kind of response. And we also utilized the RDKB um, uh, interactive engagement platform. So there was a mapping of the need, an online storytelling um, opportunity, and we hosted uh, several virtual focus groups and one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and conversations with local governments. Next slide. I can keep going. Yeah, the next one. 
So regional themes. Um, one thing we notice is that while there are patterns we see across the region, there is definitely distinct sub-regional characteristics. So um, mainly between the boundary and the Kootenai side, the communities that are clusters in Kootenai seem to have similar um, issues and experiences, and the boundary side seem to have um, different experiences and challenges. Um, and I'd say the boundary side had a lot more um, uh, um, uh, lower income households and experience of poverty but there's definitely widespread challenges. One thing I want to highlight on regional themes is migration. We do have observed trends of amenity migration, so households uh, moving to the Kootenays and Rawson specifically for recreation, lifestyle amenities, so that is definitely a driving factor um, uh, for folks. But also rural migration, we're seeing trends in people who are living in the rural areas surrounding places like Rosslyn and moving into communities, so downsizing from their large acreage properties and looking for something more accessible, closer to healthcare and amenities. So next slide. Some common experiences include increased cost of living, housing in poor condition. We're seeing that in the rental supply, which is starting to show its age and get a bit older. And I have some data I can, I can highlight here for you. Um, discrimination and stigma towards vulnerable populations. We're seeing um, some new projects being proposed and delivered um, uh, that haven't always been well received by community members that might have misunderstandings of what the needs are and um, that has been a key obstacle to, to delivering a process in a smooth fashion in some communities, especially when there's um, a high level of people experiencing homelessness, uh, particularly in Trail and Grand Forks. Um, yeah. So here's some uh, examples of, of data. One is the aging housing stock. So we can see that it, across the region, uh, housing that was built pre-1980 and pre-1960 consists of a large proportion of the stock. And to me, that raises a couple of flags of, of aging homes in need of major repair and the costs associated to that. They tend to be less accessible, so more challenges for seniors population, but it's also a time capsule. So um, housing that was built pre-1980s was was really intended to, to house families in the workforce and it worked quite well. But as demographics change over time, the housing hasn't really changed alongside with it. And so um, it isn't really working for everybody anymore, particularly the aging demographics that, that need something that are a bit different than the family oriented single detached homes. Next slide. Um, when it comes to housing prices, uh, Rossland has the most expensive housing prices of all the communities in the RDKB. You can see that red line indicates uh, Rossland with the average price of a single detached house of $362,000. Um, but we can see in trend in all communities over the last four years is that every single community is having increasing housing prices across the board. Next slide. Um, this slide is core housing need, which really demonstrates um, house, households that are spending more than what they can afford on housing, plus they have another issue such as suitability, accessibility, maybe there's not enough bedrooms for everyone in a home. The blue bars are renters and the green are homeowners. And we can see across the region that, that renters are more likely to be in core housing need. Um, but if we look at Rossland, um, it's kind of in, in the middle there, um, there's 13% of renters in core housing need and 3% of owners. So it's lower compared to neighboring communities, but it's still a figure that, that we should have a consideration that there's people that are, are under housed and having a hard time affording housing. Next slide. Um, this uh, slide shows us what the, the number of non-market housing units by community, and we can see a distinct concentration in Trail and Grand Forks, and that makes sense. We, we tend to put affordable housing in close proximity of services, amenities, and healthcare, uh, but Rosslyn is the third on the list, so um, not quite the same as, as Trail and Grand Forks, but um, there's certainly some independent social housing um, and also rent assistance in the private market, and those are rent um, supplements that are given to folks that they can use towards um, housing in the private market. So I'm not very surprised by, by that data. Yeah, go ahead, Rachel. Yeah. Uh, 
This slide uh, shows us what the projections are. So part of the legislative requirement is anticipating the number of households that are going to be living in communities in the future and the number of housing units needed to accommodate them in the future. And uh, a broad trend in, in the region is that we're actually expecting a population decline. So there's actually um, a net decrease or a net loss in the total number of units needed over time. You can see on the very far right RDKB, there's a, a net negative of 694 units needed by 2031. And so that doesn't mean that those units are going to disappear, but what it means is that there might be a risk of vacancy in the future if there's not a population circulation of people moving into the communities. Um, we have heard that there's a, a lot of people who are moving into the, into the Kootenays, um, but from our analysis, uh, we don't think that there's uh, the same level of people moving into the community to replace the aging population of seniors who are downsizing, going to retirement communities or, or possibly pass, passing away. A lot of the net decline is happening on the boundary side. Um, the Kootenai side has more of a net gain in people and units, and Rossland uh, is expecting another 27 households or 27 units needed in the future. It seems quite low when we think about um, some of the issues we have with needing more affordable housing and rental housing. Um, so it is a bit of a conundrum in terms of a growth management perspective is that you want to be able to have more housing units to accommodate, um, you know, the, the, the population, but you don't want to unintentionally oversupply or have an overhouse housing situation. So, um, I think from my perspective, it's, it's important to monitor new development that is being delivered, see how the absorption is, the wait list of that, of that, um, those new projects, and then monitor um, over time. It's not a crystal ball. We, we don't know uh, if, if these projections uh, are going to land the way BC statistics expect it to, uh, but we can just use it as a, a decision making tool. All right, um, keep going. And Rachel, we can skip over that slide just to, for time. Okay, so some more specific context on Rosslyn is, um, this is probably no surprise for Mayor and Council, that there's a contrast of year-round high-income households um, whose housing needs are comfortably met. And then we also have seasonal low-wage workers who are challenged to afford and find, find housing. There's also limited accessible units. We heard that through consultation for people specifically in Rosslyn. We also heard a lot about young working professionals who are looking to enter the home ownership market, but the cost of single detached homes, which comprise of, of a large portion of the stock, um, is really out of reach for them. And then, of course, the seasonal peak, peaks of, of demand for rental housing does make it challenging for people to find housing, but um, for others who have housing to make it available on short term basis. So well, lots of challenges there. The priority groups we identified for, for Rossland who need housing um, uh, the most are seasonal workers, workers in the service sector and tourism industry, um, seniors, single parent households, and youth and young adults. The housing gaps span quite a bit of the continuum from market rental, low end market rental, and non market rental, um, and also diverse housing typologies that aren't single detached, so ground oriented multi unit also apartments, and specifically seasonal worker accommodation. Um, we know that there is a new Midtown mixed use development project being proposed, and um, I, I'm in the opinion that it will help alleviate the pressure on the housing supply, but we don't know to what degree. So again, once that project is delivered um, and the units are being occupied, it's important to observe and monitor the absorption, uh, the waiting lists, and, uh, and that can help inform um, potential new projects in the future. Okay, so I'm going to go through these quite quickly, given uh, we're running short on time. Um, but on housing mix, I just want to say on the, on the left is, is the typology. So we can see 81% is single detached and 11% is apartments. So um, the mix there, there might be an opportunity to diversify that. And on the right hand side is, is the bedroom mix. And we can see it's mostly made up of three and four bedroom units. And the new Midtown project will help diversify the bedroom mix. So that will be quite interesting to see how, how that mix changes over time. Next. Age of housing stock aligned with the rest of um, the region, 51% pre-1960, 21% pre-1980. And that is just uh, a red flag to monitor and to see, you know, what might need to be replaced over time, redeveloped, or might need a major repair and some costs associated uh, to that. And also the livability and accessibility of those older units. 
Next slide. Um, and affordability, a key indicator here is 33% of renters in Rossland spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs, and that's uh, considered to be unaffordable. And also 10% of homeowners, so what they pay towards their mortgage and their utilities, 10% of homeowners in Rossland are also overstretched. And that means that they have less money for things like childcare, recreation, transportation, and other costs of living. Um, one thing that we took a look at was uh, potential housing mix over time. So under the baseline scenario, um, looking at 27 units needed in Rosslyn over time, we applied the exact same housing mix that we've seen historically. And we can see that that would spit out or calculate more three and four bedroom units. We played around with that housing mix to see if we can increase say one bedroom from 7% to 12% of the housing mix. And that would generate a lot more of those units. But the challenge with, with Rosslyn is that um, because there's a limited growth of only 27 units, in order for us to get more one and two bedroom units um, to the level we think that's needed, um, there would have to be a decrease in three and four bedrooms. And, and that's easier said than done. Um, this is a, an exercise of, uh, of what could or possibility. It's not a, a concrete commitment. It's just trying to see what can be done and tweaked. And I know the municipality is undertaking an OCP process. Um, exercise such as this, like a shift um, scenario, um, could be a good um, uh, exercise for, for that process to see how that, that change could happen over time. And so the final closing comments is uh, there's widespread housing needs and issues across the RDKD. We, we're seeing amenity migration and seasonal workers and young professionals who are attracted to Rosslyn, but it's expensive to live there compared to, to wages. And there seems to be low availability for households who are starting out or who are not staying long. And then also issues of accessibility for those who have been there for quite a while. Um, but again, that new housing project, I think will help alleviate um, some of the pressures, but we'll have to see in the future um, uh, what degree of alleviation that is. And my last slide is, um, uh, what can be done with these findings. So it can inform various initiatives at the local level, like the OCP, but also nonprofits and local builders, they can utilize this information for their own portfolio planning and applying for funding, CMHC, for example, and BC Housing. Um, so it can be quite um, uh, uh, versatile in that way. We did facilitate a capacity building workshop with the RDKD in terms of funding um, opportunities at the federal and provincial level. And, and that was a, a good conversation starter. Uh, but next steps are unknown. So there could be a regional affordable housing strategy or local, say the city of uh, Rosslyn, or a combination of a local and regional strategy. So that conversation ha has been um, initiated and I'm not sure where it, will, where it will go, but the needs assessment is really that baseline to inform um, actions and strategies. So I'll end it there and I'm happy to answer any questions that mayor or council may have. Thank you. All right, Council, do we have any questions for Jada? Thank you for that presentation. That was very informative. Uh, I'm looking. Anybody? Okay, Terry, go ahead. Hey, Jada, thanks very much. Um, you said that there was 13% uh, of Rosslanders were having uh, trouble with core housing. Um, do you have any kind of granular, can you paint a picture of what that actually looks like for those, for that group? Yeah, so it, it, core housing need can be um, uh, characterized differently in, in some areas, but a, one classic example in, in Rosslyn would be a low-income senior. Um, so their low income uh, would have a hard time affording with the average rents there, but they have a second issue is um, accessibility or mobility challenge. And so that layers on top of it of, a, of another barrier for them to access housing. And that is a common thing that, um, that we have been seeing in Rosslyn. And some of the neighboring communities, um, a, a, a thing that I've been seeing was a lot for low-income families and not having, not being able to afford a place that has enough bedrooms for everybody in their in their home. I had I didn't see that to the same degree in in Rosslyn. Um, it didn't really stand out in terms of what we heard and what the data was saying. But seniors is is um, a more typical, I'd say, a representative of what's happening in Rosslyn. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions. I've got a couple. Sure. Uh, thank you. This 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 was great, and it will be it's perfect timing because again, as we are doing our OCP, it'll be great to share with that with that group and also the group that's working on the MCON project. That'll be that'll be good. Although we are at ninety five percent 
finished drawings on that one. So I don't think there'll be much change there. But um, um, I was also pleased to see that you think the Midtown project will hit some of the challenges that we've got, because that obviously that's the in intent of it. So one of the things I was interested in is you're talking about um, you know, a very limited growth in Roslyn. Mm -hmm. Now we had uh, the provincial, a recent provincial thing of looking at population from 2018 had us at uh, 3,908, I think it was, or 909, mm -hmm. which is an increase from our 2016, which was 3,729. And we keep seeing a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on our housing here. There's a lot of pressure. I mean, it seems like people are coming into town and a lot of them are younger, like our average demographic is younger than some of the other communities. And then when you look at the graph in the report about the demographic um, distribution, we're quite stable. So I'm just wondering where you, where, what you're relying on to say that we're going to be looking at a decline. Yeah, so the source I used was BC Statistics and their forecasting of, um, of population of, of Rosslyn in the future. Um, and they base it off of historical trends and migration. So people who are coming to the community, leaving the community, birth rates and death rates. Um, and my opinion, it's a bit lag or it's a bit behind. It's looking behind and not really looking forward. And so your observation uh, aligns quite a bit with what we heard from stakeholders in the community is that in fact, there's a lot of people moving to places like Rossland and there is a lot of pressure. So it seems from, from my observation, a, um, a point in time where there are more people coming in is really anticipating what's hap gonna happen in five, eight, 10, 15 years from now. Um, uh, according to the, the aging population, um, uh, there, there, there appears to not be the state, the, enough people who are going to be moving in to replace everybody who's going to be aging, downsizing, um, moving to retirement homes and passing away, even though we are seeing um, the pressure today, but it's really looking ahead in the future. But it's not uh, a crystal ball. It, it certainly can change. Um, uh, major initiatives or development projects can push or pull the demographics in any way. A good example in some areas where I'm hearing proposed cannabis facilities, um, one there's near Christina Lake, for example, if that goes ahead, it's going to employ up to 100 uh, workers and there are um, some are going to be employed locally, so but some are actually going to have to move into the community and that isn't reflected in BC statistics. Um, uh, uh, historical analysis. And so um, I'd actually look at your, your economic development plan and, and framework and just seeing, you know, what could be some really big pushes in terms of major employment or changes in the region. We did have conversations with major employers and nothing really stood out to us as, as being a driver to, to really change the trend. But um, if anything major is introduced, um, then, then I would, I would go back to seeing these projections and say, you know what, I don't think this is reflected and we need to anticipate change. That said also, this year has been an anomaly. We've seen a huge out-migration of people um, moving out of places like the Lower Mainland to the Kootenays and Caribou specifically. I've seen recent data um, this summer that's not reflected in our report. We don't know if that's a point in time anomaly, if that's just a 2020 or if it's gonna continue in the future, but there was a, um, an, I guess an unexpected uh, migration that happened uh, in 2020. So I, I would I'd monitor to see if that has any, any implications because it is having an immediate effect um, today from what I've been hearing. Yeah, I think you could call it the Zoom ripple, right? Now that you work from home, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot easier. The other question I had, you had 42 units that were considered, I think, non-market housing. Mm -hmm. And you may have answered this when you talked about the rent supplements, because yeah. when I think of non-market housing in Roslyn, I think there's, a, there's, uh, there's Golden City Manor, um, and then there's three units in a fourplex, and then there's a couple of units that may still be considered non-market in Eslin Park, but other than that, we don't have any. So is that made up by those rent supplements that you mentioned in the presentation? Correct, yeah. So I just utilize OPC housing, but you're right, those aren't purpose-built affordable units. It's a subsidy attached to the person and then they can apply to the private market. Um, so you're absolutely right in that respect. Okay, yeah, that, that's great. Cause that was, a, that was, that caught my eye for sure, right? Cause I, I didn't think we had that. And you know, I mean, I'm sure as you know, we have huge waiting lists for both 
uh, Golden City Manor and for Esley Park for addressing that senior population. So Correct. And the rent supplements are only as good as availability of units. So if we see vacancy rates going down in, in Rossland, if somebody has a rent supplement, if there's nothing available, that there's nothing they can apply it to. Um, so it does work well in communities where there's, there's availability, but in, in Rossland, the pressure um, is really starting to increase and, and there's less available than there had in the past. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, great, Jada. We really appreciate this. It's a it's a good report. Oh, Janice has a question. Janice, speak up. I'm sorry, I was listening to your report. It was great, but can you just explain to me what suppressed housing is? Yes. So suppressed is just BC Housing's way of protecting uh, identity of of people. So there's um um that you're thinking of that one graph where there's the non market housing in different communities, um in places like Montrose, Warfield, Greenfield, and the electoral areas, and some degree in Ross in Rossland. If there's any number of units in a category less than five, then BC Housing will suppress it because they are just per trying to protect. Um, whoever might be uh, living in those communities. So um, they'll give me the total at the end, but they'll leave the category blank for me. Yeah, Great. good question. Okay, well, I think we will uh, make good use of this report and pass it around and, and, and share it broadly in the community. So thank you, thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you for uh, letting me speak to and present today. Thank you. Okay, that's great, thanks. Okay, we're going to move on. We've got some minutes to adopt. so we. Yeah, it looks like we seem to have lost uh, Mayor Moore here. Just give us a sec. Sorry, that would be my fault. Hey, I'm back. Was it something I said? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, okay, so we have some minutes to adopt. These are the regular meeting minutes of December 14th. I think there were a couple of corrections, but other than that, they looked fine. Anybody want to move that? Raise a little hand. Andy and Janice, any discussion on that? Uh, oh, Janice, you have to discuss? Yeah, I had, I had actually sent in a note, but it wasn't reflected. Um, in the package, item 8F on page 82, so that I had voted against that, and uh, even though it passed, but other than that, I didn't see anything else. Okay, great, thanks. That will be reflected. Um, okay, and otherwise, all in favor of adoption. Okay. All right, minutes of the Committee of the Whole. Now this one's a little tricky, right? Because we're gonna adopt these minutes and then we're gonna go back and discuss them with Janice's motion when we get to the um, community grant allocation report that came in from staff. So we'll just adopt these without a whole lot of anything and then we'll actually figure out the real numbers when we get back to that other part, okay? So can I have a, a mover? Move it, Dirk, Dirk moves it and Stu seconds it and let's just skip this and go all in favor. Okay, all in favor of the, of the numbers that are not correct, and we'll get the correct ones next time. Um, okay, and then the next thing, we have a public hearing, minutes of the public hearing on the 14th. We need a motion to adopt those. And that is Terry and Janice. Any comments on that? All in favor? Raise your little pause. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to add our, the things that we moved up. And the first one we moved up was 8C. So that's the adoption of the 100% renewable um, energy plan. And then after that, we're gonna talk about the wildlife resolution and then we'll get back to the regular agenda. Okay, so if you can go to 8C, which is on page 442 
And the staff recommendation is that we adopt the West Kootenai 100% Renewable Energy Plan as presented and further that we investigate implementation of the recommended priority actions as part of the official community plan update currently underway. And there are four items listed under there, which I will not read because you can all read them yourself. So do I have a mover? Dirk moves it and Chris seconds it. Okay, Dirk, would you like to speak? Nope, you're still muted. Well, he doesn't look muted on my end. Oh. <laughs> Just when I said we were getting good at this, huh? <laughs> okay, Dirk. Nope, still can't hear you. Rachel, is that on your end? Uh, how about now? Yeah, perfect. Oh, uh, okay. I just got to pick the right. Yeah, I had to. Um, lost my train of thought. Uh, I know a lot of work has gone into this, the Eco Society and the crew. I know a few of them, Montana, others are on, have done a fantastic job guiding us through this. And I'm just keen to get this rolling with the communities around us that are doing the same. Yeah, good. Chris, you were the secondary, I think. Yeah, I, I echo that. What a comprehensive evaluation of our situation here. And well done. Yeah. Any other comments and questions? Nobody? Okay, I've got a, a couple. I'm really pleased to see this finally come. I know it's been a long and great collaboration with our partner communities. Caslow and Warfield have already adopted it. Warfield is about to, I mean, um, sorry, Castlegar is about to. They they discussed it at a committee of the whole and they unanimously agreed to send it up to their next council meeting, which will be a little later in January. So, you know, for us, the timing's really good because we are looking at our OCP right now. Um, and the other thing that we're going to be doing, and this is just a little note to council, is that we're going to be reviewing our strat plan um, shortly. And I would really like to see the priority items identified by staff included in our strat plan, not just, I mean, the OCP is a 10, you know, guide us for 10 years, but our strat plan is much more um, immediate. And I'd like to see uh, these things included in our strat plan and the OCP can actually take on some of the more ambitious um, goals that were put in the 100% renewable plan. So anyway, I'm obviously all in favor of this too. Okay, anything else or I will call the question. All in favor of adopting the plan. All right, unanimous, thank you. Okay, so now we go, we'll take a quick look at the wildlife uh, standard procedure for wildlife rehabilitation. I wanna give just a tiny bit of background on this. Um, we did bring this to AKBLG before and it failed mostly because there was a guy there who thought this motion was tying the hands of the conservation officers, which was not its intent. Um, I did have a conversation very last minute with an AKBLG board member talking about it. Um, and unfortunately she wasn't available over the, over the holiday to discuss this. So it just came in at the last minute. I don't know if you guys saw the email that I sent out kind of shortly before the meeting, nod your heads if you did, Janice did, if you, oh, Andy didn't, okay. Other guys did, didn't. Okay, then I'm just gonna, the, the whereas and, the, and the, um, the first couple of paragraphs are the same, therefore, I'll just read it. It's not, it's not that different, really. It's just, um, therefore, be it resolved, BC provincial government support the work and informed decision-making by the conservation officers to consider, not require, orphaned and injured juvenile wildlife for rehabilitation by providing up-to-date information on licensed rehabilitation facilities located in the province. The point the board member was making is that to make sure that we're communicating that we're not tying the hands of the conservation officers, but our intent is to give them more information so they can make better decisions. They're still the ones making the decisions. And then the other thing was just split out the other part of working together on a standardized procedure is just in a separate paragraph as it be it further resolved. And then the, the paragraph is the same. So honestly, there's not a lot different about it other than we're just putting front and center that the intent of this thing is to support the work and inform decision-making by the COs, not to interfere with their decision-making, just give them more information. Um, okay, so I make the motion and can I have a seconder? Janice seconds. Okay. Um, I've already said what I'm saying about it. So Janice, do you have anything to add? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I know. I know. 
I was pressing my space bar and it wasn't working. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm happy. Uh, actually, you're, the reworded one is even better. And I'm happy to give this a second go through AKGLB. And uh, hopefully they'll understand it's a supportive, uh, it's a motion to provide more support uh, for some better wildlife outcomes versus um, restricting the work of the COs. Okay, great. Anybody else have anything they want to say about it? We're all good. The other thing I did ask this board member, was there a problem of us bringing back something we put forward in 2019, bringing it back again? And she said that it, that it wasn't. It's fine. We have every right to bring it forward again. Um, and give it a, a second, a second uh, kick at the can. Okay, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled agenda. Look back a couple pages, and we are at referrals from prior meetings, and this takes us to our community grant funding allocation. And the motion is that council adjust the committee the whole recommended allocations for the 2021 community grant funding program as presented in our package and further that we approve the community grant funding allocations. So someone can make that motion and then we can have a discussion. Okay, Stuart makes the motion and a seconder. Seconder, Janice seconds. Okay, Stuart, go ahead and speak. I don't think our process was perfect. It was a function of us coming to an agreement based on our varying perspectives on the matters. And uh, I think we worked our way through it in a reasonable manner and we we achieved what I thought was uh, something, well, I mean, effectively we, we got to a point that we all agreed upon. And uh, on that basis, I think that's what we should go with. Okay, so the motion on the table is to accept the staff recommendation, which is where we had asked them at the end of the meeting to, to round the numbers a bit, and they did. So those are the numbers we're looking at. Rachel, could you put that portion of the, of the, of the screen, of the package on the screen, please? That's asking for extra credit. But just so we all know what the numbers are, I think. Okay, and Janice, you were the, okay, let's see, that's not where we are. It's the one that uh, yeah, that's the minutes. That's the minutes. Go go to the report, which is uh, farther down. 6A. So Janice, while we're while we're getting 6A report page up, you can you you as the uh, there we go. Okay, that's the 6A. Um, um, so as the seconder, you can you can speak here. Yeah, I actually quite uh, I'm actually quite happy with uh, with changing the process to the uh, averaging process. I think that that um, gives us some wider scope to support uh, community groups in different ways versus the going through and voting on trying to find a number we all agree with. I think that works better. Um, I my only challenge is that you know we sort of decided on the averaging with a brief conversation at the end. Um, and certainly as someone who had two conflicts, I had put, you know, values in for those particular groups. And uh, really, that's the same as me voting on it. So, you know, I'd like us to manage it the same way that we manage the CIP where, for instance, where I have a conflict, instead of me putting an amount, I'm just automatically assigned the, uh, automatically assigned the averaged amount. Mm -hmm. So it neither detracts from the group from having a relationship with me or um <clears throat> nor does it uh but also i uh, you know i'm not i'm ethically not voting on something i shouldn't be yeah i think that that makes sense um Stuart, i saw your hand up yeah i i accept janice's point and if we wanted to adopt uh, an averaging process then that 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 should apply i just don't think we actually did that <laughs> no yeah you know, we, we we you know we didn't agree to that process we started with a a rough approximation based on a first go around and then we horse traded from there and then we all agreed on an amount there wasn't a formal process that we agreed upon at any point we just we worked our way through it we adapted what we started as a an averaging and we got to a point that we agreed upon and we voted on that it wasn't we didn't start with we we didn't vote on a process first and then apply it we just bumbled our way through it. At any point in that process, we could have gone to 
you know, grinding our way through individual motions, but it was a long night and we didn't want to do that. We, 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 we figured we had a, a shortcut to get there and we went for it. Right. That, that wasn't, that wasn't the actual process we went through. Yeah, that's true. Janice. Well, I would, I actually disagree because we had a very short but specific discussion after we had reviewed all the different groups um, that uh, Mayor Moore had provided a averaged um, amount and that we agreed that the average was the way that we were going to go, which means we were changing our process. We, we did. We just didn't start the meeting saying that because originally I wasn't sure that averaging for the community groups as we do for SIP was going to be fair to the groups. Um, as it turned out, and this is what I, what I love about you guys, is we came to a very fair allocation, I think, for, for all the groups. I mean, that's one of the things when you look at it, you can say, well, there were conflicts here and there were conflicts there and people stepped out of the room and stepped back in the room. But in the end, everything came out fair. And when you look at this and when you look at, you know, the, the conflicts that people have or don't have, um, most of it, we all put forward numbers that were in the best interest of the community, regardless of, of things. So I think the, it's a little, yeah, maybe it was a little messy, but I'm really pleased with the result. When you, when you look at this final adjusted amount that staff has come to us, I think that very, that, that presents what we wanted to do very well. So that would be my comment. I'm gonna, before I go back to Stu and Janice, I'm gonna see if anybody else wants to comment because you guys have spoken. So Dirk and Chris, I can see you. I can't actually see Andy, but let me go down my screen a little bit. Did you, Chris, you wanna speak? Yeah, I was happy with the process. I thought it ended up fair for, for the groups that uh, they got with what they asked for. Um, and I think that you know the ones that didn't get the funding that they requested I think we all came to terms with that as a group. I'm, I was happy with the process. Yeah, okay. Um, Andy or Terry, you guys haven't spoken. I, I would agree that I think that, you know, in the end uh, it worked out well. And because of our experience with CIP, I think we just came to an, to an arrangement where we've, that's worked for us in the past. Uh, yeah, in a different, for di a different uh, grant funding uh, process, but as it turned out, I think it, it yeah, for me, it, it, I felt like it was fair. Okay, okay, so it, that's good. I mean, if we've got things that we're all just basically saying we're agreeing with, that's good. If anyone has something different they wanna say, Terry or Dirk, otherwise I'm gonna go back to Stu and Janice that had something they wanted to say, otherwise we can move forward. Anything, Terry or Dirk? Mm, Terry. Um, well, it was, it was pretty interesting to me because I was, uh, so, Yes, it worked out in the end. I think it, you know, things came out in the wash. But uh, when when I think of um, you know the the, the uh, factors that were pushing and pulling on me as I was trying to make decisions, along with looking at at the numbers that everybody else had already put down, um, you know, I, I, it occurred to me that um, again, I'm not suggesting we mess with it, but uh, you know, a blind, uh, uh, perhaps blind bidding, if you will, uh, might have might have uh, changed the scope in somehow. I'm not suggesting so so that as I saw everybody else's numbers, um, I was going, okay, those folks are doing that, and I feel a little different, so I'm going to do this. So we all had to to make those those tough calls, but um, in terms of a uh, uh, a system that allowed people to be influenced um, there could be some other different ways to do it in the future but I don't think now's the time so that's just my comment that uh, as a first timer through something like this um, uh, I felt like uh, there was a lot of um, push pull in my head um, the system was was pretty good though are you suggesting that we just not identify counselors who are putting in the numbers Is, are you is that what you're saying? Um, I was thinking that uh, if, if we if we knew how much we had to spend and we saw all of these things, if we if we put in our numbers beside each group and didn't allow each other to see what our numbers were, and then and then did a big reveal at the end, that that might have been. Um, well, we're transparent and open, Terry. <laughs> Actually, we, we, we could do that. I mean, we, we certainly could do that. We've, we've sort of done that before. People do their homework ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it just, it's kind of easier to, I just, in, in, the, in the interest of moving it along, 
it's good to have the spreadsheet there that then everybody can see and, and work with. Of course, sometimes we haven't been on Zoom, so people don't necessarily see the spreadsheet unless, mm -hmm. unless they're writing everybody's numbers in, which is what we've done in person. Okay, I'm going to go back to Stu and then Janice, and then I, I think we'll move on if there's nothing more. Stu, you were up. Yeah, I just I wanted to re reiterate my point that I don't think we, we need to be bound by a we weren't bound by a process. We just, we made it up on, on the fly. You know, if, if the numbers had come out differently and a majority of us had been dissatisfied with the amounts for any reason, we could have gone back to bringing forward motions for individual groups. We should remain, we should still have that flexibility. You know, ultimately it's whatever we come up with and agree to as a council that matters. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think this was a strict, you know, allocated process. It had it started with elements of that, and then it evolved, and then we got to a point that we all agreed upon, you know. And I don't, I don't think, you know, I don't think we'd be stronger or or we'd have a better process because we we did develop a, a strict, you know, CIP style process with a whole bunch of you know spreadsheet variables that that counted for all these different things. I, I don't know where that would be any better but that, that's not what we did. Okay, Jens. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm certainly not arguing that the process that we followed was, is not, didn't work out for us. Um, you know, I'm just thinking of it from an ethical point of view. Uh, I essentially voted for two groups that I was supposed to have a conflict for. I left the room when we discussed it, uh, but I voted and I'm not comfortable with that. And, uh, you know, Mayor Moore sent out an email earlier this week with the adjusted numbers, which are not significantly different by any means. They're tiny little changes. Um, so, you know, my purpose of bringing forward my motion was because I'd like us to not only be transparent and supportive of our community groups, but also do it in an ethical way. And I'm not comfortable voting on groups that I have a conflict on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that. I think I think uh, you know to be the most ethical and transparent, it would be that just that amount of the average gets gets shoved in. And and if the result had been when when staff went back and did their rounding, and if the result had been different, where I felt like, ooh, you know, we've really done something here that that isn't right, I would say yeah. But honestly, the as you mentioned, the differences were so small. I'm perfectly comfortable going with what staff how staff had rounded it, and then we can you know each year we learn, we get better, and and next year, that's what we'll do. So, or not. Or we, or we can discuss in advance what we want to do. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I send out a thing saying, hey, this is how I think we could we could do it. And if you guys want to make something else, when well, you want to suggest something else, then write back to me. I mean, I'm, I consider myself queen of the world, but hey, I listen to you, you know. <laughs> so if you have better ideas, I just put forward the idea that I had of how we of how we could do it. You know, and initially, I didn't think averaging was going to work because I thought we might really screw up some of these groups, potentially, but we didn't, right? Averaging worked out just fine. And Janice's point of having you, you step out. I mean, I, again, some of the conflict things are, they're, they're so tenuous, right? That, you know, I think it's, I think it's just that. Anyway, okay. Unless somebody has anything else, I'm going to call the question. And the motion is that we will accept the rounded numbers that staff put together based on where we had gone with that. All in favor? And opposed? Janice, you're opposed? Okay, Janice opposed. Okay, fair well, enough. My ethics, not to do with the end, end result of the process. Okay, no, fair enough. That's it. It's a, it's a good point, we, and we appreciate that. Okay, so uh, now we are on to business license amendment number 2744. This is up for adoption. This should be quick. Who wants to move that? Mover, okay, Chris is a mover and Stu, any comments on this? I think not, all in favor for adoption? Okay, now we get to do it again, water rate bylaw 2746, it's also up for adoption. Who wants to move that? Mava does, okay, Dirk and Janice, any comments? All in favor? Okay, the last one we've got for adoption, sewer rate bylaw 2747, mover, Andy, seconder, Terry, only because he didn't put his hand up. <laughs> okay, all in favor of adoption. 
All right, thanks, that's great. All right, now we've got the housing needs report. And this is basically that we just um, endorse it. And there's, there's not really any action here. Once it's endorsed, it's gonna go off to the OCP um, advisory committee and the public and anybody else that wants to use it. So we'll take a, a mover. Terry moves it, Chris seconds it. Any discussion? Uh, first, I'm gonna ask Terry and then Chris, anything, cause you guys are movers and seconders. And then I'm gonna go to Stuart who has a comment. You guys, anything? Nothing? Okay, Stuart. Yeah, I just found the report based on historical trends didn't really cover our most significant challenge, which is the potential of amenity migration and explosive growth, which we're all aware of in comparable mountain communities throughout North America. And, you know, that's, that's what everybody that I talk to is concerned about and doesn't have any good answers for. And, you know, we've got this very fancy report and it doesn't really dig into those details. Um, I think it's inadequate in that respect. Yeah, and, and as Jada mentioned, you know, she mentioned that, that that's the great unknown, right? And there wasn't a lot of projection there. Janice. It's funny, I had something similarly written down uh, I mean, it, it, our housing needs report is sort of legislatively required for us to move forward, get grants, work towards fixing some of our housing needs. You know, whether or not we actually think it's comprehensive and accurate, we need one. So we can certainly work on uh, updating, ref, you know, bulking it up, getting it uh, more in line with what we're actually seeing happening uh, as we move forward. But I think this, it's a good start. It's a good yeah. place to start. Yeah, well, it's a second re iteration of it, and it does have to be done every five years. Andy, you had your hand up? Yeah, just, just that uh, on Stu's point, I think it's going to be uh, important for uh, the OCP committee maybe to, to take a look at the possibility of expanding, uh, you know, the results of that report and looking at maybe if there, if there is uh, um, other ways to seek the information that would, would best benefit us, uh, we should consider that. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe it's just, you know, provide some cursory information at this point uh, that will that'll allow us to move forward and something specific for Rosalind uh, that we may be looking through our OCP process. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be keen to know, uh, you know, where, where the committee would like to go beyond what this report offers. Well, the advisory committee is not, I mean, we're not gonna be commissioning additional reports, right? And it's more now moving into the public engagement phase as opposed to a reporting phase. Um, I don't know if Stacey from the line wants to comment on that, but I think this, this report, it, it, it lack, as Stu said, pointed out, it does lack that um, future risk that we all see. Um, and that's unfortunate, but I, I'm not anticipating that our OCP process unless we unless council decides to allocate extra money to do something further i'm not seeing that and now i'm going to just check and see if stacy wants to say anything on that yeah i'm just going to agree with all your comments i completely thought the same thing when i read the document i thought it's not telling it doesn't paint the picture at all of what's happening and i had we had conversations with the team saying that you know when they put out a draft report, I saw that and thought, this is not, ref that, that's not what ha what's happening here. And I think it's just the lack of availability of data for amenity migration. I mean, it, it goes in ebbs and flows um, and then they just don't have anything. So they're always looking backwards. Um, yeah, I think it's a good step moving forward. I agree with you, Kathy, the OCP uh, advisory team doesn't have any extra information other than more money to do another report. I think we just, uh, I mean, I know that our consultants, they read this housing needs report and thought, oh, how are we going to do growth analysis with this? Because we've asked them to do a growth analysis. So I think we're going to have to do what we've often done in other OCPs because this data that's coming from the province has always said our, our population is declining and it hasn't been. So I think in other OCPs, we've just kind of made up numbers ourselves based on what we see anecdotally through building permits and business licenses and, and just go on with it from there. Yeah, okay, Stuart. Now, there are organizations that are looking into this in comparable communities. I know Stacy's attended a symposium on it and I've listened in on a bunch of webinars. 
there's there's lots of good information out there of comparable communities you know um you know the, the resources are available if we if we choose to access them okay great all right any other comments on this anybody have anything? i do um as we, as we move out of 2016 um is, is there an opportunity to update the data um they say the cycle's five years you know it'd be nice to get some current data at least. Well, it's interesting because I don't know what the province used when they calculated that, that grant that we got, but they were saying we were at 3,900 people, right? And I don't know what they looked at. Stacy, do you have any idea where those numbers came from? No, I don't. I would assume BC stats, but I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's been no census. So um, yes, Janice. Well, the current, funny, I was crunching some numbers just the other day, and uh, <laughs> the current 2020 BCC, yeah, look, it's even Stu laughs at that. Um, the current 2020 BC stats estimate of our population is actually 4109. Really? And I would, I would, money. sorry? We need more I grant money then. They cheated. I would suggest that, um, I mean, I, you know, I've been kind of keeping track of how many new homeowner grants we've been generating. And, you know, the census says we're 2.3 people per household. If you kind of extrapolate a bit, we're in that area. And I'm sure that the province can use things like um, assigning health care cards to postal codes and, you know, which may capture some people outside of our boundary. But um, you know, I'm sure that, uh, you know, in fact, our growth is uh, much stronger than, I mean, I just listening to the report, we need 27 new units. Well, we do 32 every year minimum. So, you know, I don't, I think we're going to need more than 27 in the next 10 years. Yeah. Stuart. Yeah, I don't want to get too uh, far off topic and don't want to push us up against the, the $5,000 limit that we, at uh, the 5,000 person limit that we uh, seem to be trying to keep under. But I know that um, Revelstoke was facing similar challenges where they they understood they had much higher population than, than any of the official stats were showing. And they paid for TALUS to do um, a, a study of the permanent, you know, cell phones that were living in Revelstoke and came up with a much higher number, which they are able to use for, for funding and healthcare and traffic studies and a whole bunch of different things, you know. That's interesting, I hadn't heard of that before. You can basically, pay, yeah. you gotta pay for it. It's quite right. expensive, but you can tell who's living here based on how many cell phones are actually living in Roslyn. Yeah, Stacy, you got that? You might, uh, yeah, that's good, that? that's interesting. I didn't know that either. Okay, so we are going to vote on endorsing this, I think, and then we'll move on. Any, oh, Andy, you want to say something else? No, we're going to vote. Okay, okay. All in favor of endorsing. All right, great. Okay, so now we've got a development permit, and this is for 2024 Columbia Avenue, and this is that we permit an apartment extension on the back of Clancy's. Do I have a mover for this? Mover, Terry moves, and Chris. Okay, Terry, you want to speak to it? You're, you're muted. <laughs> uh, met with the design review panel and uh, it talked about this uh, I, and nobody had any objections uh, in terms of a design review. So that was, that was good. Uh, what occurred to me was the need for, um, you know, a long-term plan um, for Sourdough Alley, just so that we, so that, um, you know, this place will be the best looking spot in in sourdough by a long shot, but uh, if, if we were ever going to expand uh, services in the back, what would it look like? But that's an aside. Um, the design review panel said, no, this looks good. So there we go. Good, Chris. I, I completely concur with Terry. Um, I'd, this is a great start back there. And I think that if, we, if it can be done appropriately, um, I think it could lead to, to more back there, which it, it fixes a few things, um, specifically uh, our housing needs, um, non-specifically how ugly it is back there. Yeah, it'll, it'll be an improvement. Okay, I'm going to call the question on this. No other comments? All in favor? Okay, good job. All right, so now we've got Red Mountain parking lots. This is an extension of their temporary use permit. Um, get a mover on this. Janice moves to seconds. Janice comments. 
Yeah, I was, um, I think that I like this. Um, having adequate parking benefits locals for the entire region um, and beyond who traveled to Rawson to ski for a day or more. Um, as much as I'd love to see them spend some money on some other alternatives for local for the local Rosin population, other than driving our cars up there, um, maybe expanding the bus schedule and routing. Um, this, you know, is a necessary part of uh, them running their business and us enjoying it. Okay, Stuart, you your seconder. Yeah, I don't have any problems with it. Seems like they're actually doing a pretty reasonable job of parking and traffic flow up there this year, so. It's all going good. I have one question for Stacy. Um, do we know anything about their long-term plans? Are they, I'm assuming they're still going with the uh, lot across the highway. Yeah, that's still in their long-term plan. And then the North portal access um, by Topping Creek chair. Yeah, that's, that's still in their plans. And I mean, they know that this is just a temporary. So if they want to make these parking long-term, they need to apply for a rezoning and when the three years is up. So, um, yeah, that's as far as I know, that's still in the plan. Okay, thanks. Dirk. Yeah, I think, did I have me this time? Am I no, you're one? good. Oh, good. Um, I think I got three mics going somehow. But uh, uh, sort of echoing and building a little bit on what Janice said is that uh, th there is an embedded contribution to our greenhouse gases by providing a space for this many people to drive five minutes to go skiing, notwithstanding other people. But I'd like to see as well a plan from the resort to shuttle people up in a better manner. Uh, and I think that it's in their best interest and our best interest to do that, given that it's an embedded contribution to the climate problem. Yeah, so the shuttle currently is, is funded partially by RED and partially by other businesses. And, you know, there's a lot of different people that that pay into that. It's not just a red service that's that is offered. And some of the times they've had they've had the shuttle go in a bigger circle and that hasn't has worked. Like it went out to Blackjack and it came down to Lower Roslyn and it, it didn't work. So yeah, I mean I think there's definitely something that needs to be talked about. And that would be a great topic for the OCP also. You know. Okay, anybody else? Stuart. Yeah, we need a ski back trial to downtown. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> Okay, call the question here. All in favor? Okay, thanks. Okay, so now we have our proposed Roslyn COVID-19 safe restart funding usage. Oh, what fun to spend $1.2 million. Staff had some great ideas here. Um, can I get a mover? This is that, uh, um, we're, okay, so the motion is that we initially review possible uses of this, the funding in conjunction with development of our financial plan and provide staff with further direction. So do we have further direction we want? They had some good suggestions there. What do we say? Okay, Janice, you've got a motion. No, I don't have a motion. I think it looks good and I like the, uh, the options they've uh, given us and happy not to, to not rush into spending it all this year when we may have some ongoing issues we need to deal with over the next couple of years. Okay, so perhaps your motion could just drop and provide staff with further direction if you look at the, if you look at the motion because okay. you, you like it the way it is and we'll see. I do like it the way it is. Okay, so that's the motion. Will someone second that? Stuart will second it. Okay, and um, Stuart, you are the seconder. Would you like to speak to it? Yay, bylaw officer. Yes. <laughs> no, that was a great one. Okay, then Chris had his hand up and then Dirk. No comment. That was the exact thing I was going to say. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, Dirk. Uh, I, I was going to say, uh, yay, bylaw officer, but something like that commits us to a uh, uh, tax increase in three years when this runs out. And so I, I, I don't think that we should be jumping in and expanding our capacity now while it's funded without figuring out how we're going to fund it three years from now when it is no longer funded. So I, I think I just worry that we're building on our burden now. We're going to have those 27 more units though, you know. Okay, I'm going to go to Janice and then I think staff wants to speak. So uh, Kathy actually kind of jumped in ahead. I mean, it, uh, with our growth rate, if we use this money to get a full-time bylaw officer started, um, I have every confidence that in two to three years, we'll have expanded our tax base to the point where no one's taxes go up, but we'll have enough revenue to continue paying for it. 
and all the fines. Yeah, yeah, we'll get fines. Okay, I want to see if staff wants to say something. Yeah, no, it's just the same comment we were going to say. And we already, we're not starting at zero. We already have approximately 45 to 50% of one FTE for a bylaw enforcement officer, which is what we're paying Selkirk security right now, right, with our, with the shuttle and everything. So it's just, just, just allows us to move this program in-house and plan to continue on with that same revenue increases that as Councilor Nightingale just uh, talked about for us to develop something that we do would eventually have this uh, full-time in-house within like two to three years instead of jumping from a half-time to a full-time within one full calendar year. Okay. All right. Other comments? Other comments? I had one and that was on the um, to how to make this work with community groups. Like I really like the idea that we might be able to bump up their allocation because they have suffered you know when you think of RCAC not having you know revenues or you know the curling people not having any not having any bar tabs or whatever um, but I'm wondering should we consider some other groups besides the ones that apply to us for um, for community for community support like I was thinking maybe the scouts maybe the maybe the lions um, you know maybe the legion they do remembrance day their property drive I'm sure had to have been tanked um, you know, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. And actually, because we are going to look at this in conjunction with the financial plan, maybe that's just something staff can think about. But I thought I'd throw it out to council and see what you guys think about that, too. Don't all think at once. Stuart. <laughs> I think we should start with the organizations we have a responsibility for through our existing arrangements. Um, you know, if we're sitting on a pot of money looking for something to do with it, we could always establish a fixed amount of money and then put together an assessment process and invite other groups to apply. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know if, I don't know where we're at. Yeah, good idea. Janice. Yeah, I, I don't hate the idea of expanding it if we're able to, um, but you know, I agree with Stuart that we should start with the groups that uh, we have a pre-existing relationship with who are running some of our facilities and providing services and who have been uh, directly impacted uh, because if they went away then we would have to absorb the entire cost of running the organization so well yeah but that 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 brings up the curling club who run the curling facility and it brings up lions campground who run our municipally owned campground so they we those are groups and scout hall, scout hall for that matter you I know mean, seeking scouts since they're looking to do this energy efficiency uh, thing on the building maybe there's a fix there so anyway those were the kinds of groups I was thinking of ones that do have a connection and that we have that we have a relationship with so okay do I see any other hands up I think we I think staff has done a fantastic so, job of bringing these ideas forward and I and I think there's you know there's there's more work that'll that'll happen there that we'll hear about when we get into our financial plan Chris sorry do you want to say something yeah, so um, not unlike the grant and aid process, would it be prudent for these these groups to come back to us and say, okay, well, here's my open book and um, we could use the help? Oh, yeah, I think, I think it would. There'd have to be something where they'd need to come back to show us that they had some impact from COVID because this is the COVID, you know, recovery fund, right? And yeah, I think staff yeah. will have that completely dialed. Um, okay, so let's vote on the motion that Janice put forward, which is like, we like what staff said. All in favor? Okay, good. Um, okay, so speaking of groups that need help, here's the Curling Club relief and the uh, staff recommendation is that we approve prorating their facility usage rates for this year um, based on the provincial re restrictions that have kind of curtailed their activities. Have a mover. Uh, Dirk moves it and the seconder is Chris. Okay, Dirk, you want to say anything about it? Uh, other than that, I mean, it, it appeared that it was already there in Section 711 of their contract. But if they, we told them they had to change their service, then it would be prorated. Oh, I didn't catch that. Good for you, little eagle, eagle eye reader. Um, Chris. Yeah, I concur with that. I, I think that it's excellent that we do this too. Okay. Anyway, it makes us look good, even if it's in their contract. Stuart? Uh, maybe it was yeah. in there, but I didn't recall. Does this... Get, is this covered by our COVID relief funds? Uh, yeah, I think it would be actually. Staff, if it isn't, tell us now. And Janice is going to speak next. Oh, this, this could be part of our COVID relief funds. Okay. okay. 
Great, thanks. Janice. Yeah, I, I mean, I think if they can't get into the facility due to no fault of their own, which is the situation we're in that prorating it is the right thing to do. Um, and I noted in their letter that, you know, they speak like they're doing all the maintenance of all the ice just so they can get started again. But I, you know, yeah, we're running the plant and yeah, providing the water and the electricity and everything else so that they can do that. It's not just the ice makers wages that are the cost of keeping that ice in so that we can hopefully start again in the next little while for all our ice sports. So, um, but yes, some sort of proration for them and hopefully they'll pass those savings on to their members. Okay. Terry, did you have your hand up? Well, was there, uh, is there implications uh, for other user groups? So I'm thinking of hockey teams and, and so on. Is this, uh, is this, how is this the same and different? No, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, staff? Sure. Yeah, it's Christy here. So there, um, we've dealt with these, the other groups that you're specifically talking about there are on a per use uh, ice rental. They don't have exclusive uh, facility use agreements for an entire space for an entire season. So their cancellations are fine. And then as far as the other groups that would be similar to this, it would be um, like Golden Bear Flux Climbing, places like that, which we've dealt with these COVID reliefs as one-offs as they come in and need them rather than a blanket policy for all of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, great. Okay, anything else on this? I'll call the question on COVID-19 relief for the curling club. All in favor? Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Okay, so now this is an exciting one. Our Center Star Gulch Dam Reservoir and Dam Improvement Project. We're always good to do that. Now, I think you saw the email that I put forward to staff today asking about OFER, which staff answered. So this is focusing on Center Star. Um, can I have a mover that we direct staff to develop and submit the application? Andy makes the motion. Seconder, Janice. Any comments? All good, Janice, all good. Okay. Oh, Dirk, any, are you voting or are you commenting? Uh, commenting. Okay. I just, I, there was some talk about uh, dredging the reservoir bottom to increase capacity, but increasing capacity seems like it'd be a really good idea for us in August. Is that, can that be a priority? I don't know uh, that. Staff? Yes, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, yeah, you know, it's not the uh, main uh, focus from the federal report to say that that was one of the main uh, considerations, but it is on the list. Uh, we are working with engineering right now to compile what we need to do. And like I said, when we get further into it, we'll see where that is on the priority. Okay, thanks. Okay, anything else on that? Good to go, we love grants, all in favor? No one opposed, okay. Um, let's see, we did our renewable energy plan. That's awesome. We are now on our corporate management work plan. Gosh, I love this report. Okay, so this is just for information purposes only. This is the tracking sheet. So I'm just curious, does anyone on council have comments or questions? It's an excellent snapshot of the accomplishments during, ah, shall we say a very, very challenging year. So anybody wanna have any words of uh, comments on that? Okay, and we'll look forward to this. I just have to say once again, it's really nice to see these regular reports that come forward that we get to, uh, you know, that we get. I mean, for the I've now been involved twelve years, and one of the things, one of the things that was always talked about, like seriously, more than a decade ago, was the need for Roslyn to modernize. And I, when I just see all the things that are on here, become a more efficient, and you know, I, I just, I just think it's, it's actually finally really happening. So that's great. So okay. So, and then also we need to think about these, these things that are in this work plan when we start looking at our strap plan again um, to make sure we're moving these things forward so we're working all on the same page along with staff. So no motion needed there. Um, okay, but now there is a motion and this is unusual. Don't sh get shocked and fall off your chair, but we do need to make a motion that we approve the updated task list because as you can see, staff has gone through and they've moved things off the task list and into the work plan, which is actually a really good efficient way to do it. Um, I think it looks great, can, makes good sense. Do I have a mover? Janice is the mover and a seconder. Seconder, Chris is the seconder. Okay, Janice, you wanna comment? 
Uh, both these pieces of uh, work are excellent and I appreciate seeing both of them and good job staff. Okay, and Andy, you were the seconder, I think, right? No, it was me. Oh, sorry. No worries. Yeah, and I, I'll, I too appreciate these. These are great to read. Okay, good. Okay, so let's see here. I think, oh, wait. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a 40 second second pause while Dirk uh, goes and changes the record album. So just hang tight. And then we're going to move into our correspondence and talk about the uh, Roslyn Scouts. I like it. It's like bring your kids to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Stu can bring his cats. I could bring my cats too. I know you should. I get to see your cats when it was, there's one, there's one right was there. Christmas. They were wandering back and forth in the background. Right there. <laughs> oh yeah, asleep on the couch. I see, black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know where the other one is. I can always tell when mine has been in the office because I come up and he's walked back and forth across my keyboard, and there's all sorts of weird stuff open on my screen. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you know, the Zoom thing isn't all bad. I mean, when you look at it tonight, like we had quite a number of people who were in the gallery who came, who probably wouldn't have come to a regular council meeting. I mean, they were interested in something specific on the agenda and when people are there and they can like dive in and dive out. I mean, there's, there's a way that the Zoom thing actually works pretty well. All right, Dirk is back. So now we are gonna talk about letters of support for some worthy projects here. First one up is the second Roslyn Scouts. They're gonna improve our building. What's not to like about that? So that we provide a letter of support for them to Columbia Basin Trust. Take them over. Okay, Terry and Stu, any comments on it? It's a good plan, we love grants. We no, love grants, good. I've already written a letter, so hopefully you guys will approve it. Okay, all in favor? <laughs> okay. And uh, Roslyn Arena Society, same thing. Now they're going for the same, the same grant, but the thing that's nice, both of these are fairly small. They're asking for something fairly small, well under what the grant uh, allows, $100,000. So I think we have a really good chance of getting both of them. So do I have a mover on this one? Uh, Dirk and Andy, okay, any comments? No, nope. all in favor. That letter's already written too. Rachel will be so happy. Um, okay, so we are now to members reports. Chris, I'm going to start with you. I had my first tourism Rossland uh, meeting. Uh, it, it was it was good. Other than that, Merry Christmas. A happy New Year. Happy New Year. Okay, Andy, how about you? Needs to unmute. Uh, I'll have a. Uh, December report coming at the next council meeting um, for our RDKB stuff. Um, lots of meetings coming up and I have, just as I mentioned, um, I've joined a group called the Regional Connect Connectivity Committee, um, which was the former broadband group. It was all over basically the Kootenays and into Columbia's actually too, or some of the involved. Um, both uh, Chair Langman uh, and myself are, are sitting on that committee and uh, had our first committee meeting uh, just before Christmas. So I'll do a report on that. And it, it's kind of, hopefully will be good timing as well. Everything is timing with OCP right now, the OCP process. And I'll bring some information that hopefully can be shared with the committee um, about uh, connectivity options and hopefully opportunities for Roslyn. Okay, is that, I, I, you may have said it and I missed it. How broad is that group? Very, it uh, right over to the Sioux Swap and the Columbia's. Okay. So uh, it, it includes all the Kootenays uh, as well. So it's, it, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, Johnny sat in on that from, from CBT um, and uh, a, a whole bunch of people. It, it was just an inaugural meeting. So it was fairly high level, but hopefully um, I know we have a meeting later in this month, more detail and, 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 opportunity hopefully will come out um, just to see. I will I will provide an update and a, and a, a background as to what they're all about. I think I sent everybody that report a while. This goes back a number a number of months when the when the head of the CBBC was still there. Um, but that would be a good report to 
bring to that whole group's attention if they haven't all seen it. So if, if you if you don't know where it is, contact me and I'll make sure it goes out again. I, I, I will ask for that for sure. Terry, Thanks. you're up. Um, just a, a repeat of what I um, mentioned, met my, had my first design review panel, uh, nothing with the library, but uh, got to know the players there, get my feet wet in that first uh, thing and understand a little bit of the process involved there. So um, it was a good, good start there. Great. Okay. Janice. Yeah, I, uh, this is a bit of a two, two put together. Uh, November 17th, I attended the Seaball AGM. They're a really great group. So if you know uh, anyone, they do all sorts of different types of literacy for seniors, youth, computer, uh, physical, reading, anything. And uh, really great group. Um, it's one of my favorite committees to go to, actually. Uh, November 18th, I attended the Roslyn Community Health Clinic meeting. And so we're looking at options and timings that would work to provide a new improved model of healthcare in Roslyn. Uh, November 25th and December 9th, I attended Midtown, uh, Midtown development meetings. And uh, November 25th, I actually attended the- uh, oh, not yes. Dennis, We had a meeting December 14th. I know, and I didn't do this, so now I'm catching up. Oh, that's right. You didn't have your, you didn't have your oral meeting, that, your oral- I meeting. forgot to do it. Sorry. Uh, November 25th, I attended the uh, Ross and Arena Society AGM. The group has been very successful, generating revenue through their golf tournament, ongoing bottle collections, along with merchandise sales. They're very excited to be getting going on the lounge renewal and improvement project, uh, which, they, which will benefit many users of the facility, both new and old, uh, ice and non-ice. And uh, December 7th, I was very proud to present checks to both the Rosin Food Bank and the Firefighters uh, Christmas Hamper for $250 each on behalf of the Smokettes women's hockey team. And since December 14th, I have nothing to report. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. I forgot you, you, lost, you missed out on uh, December 14th. Stuart, you're up. I've just been eating and drinking and skiing powder. <laughs> Nice, very Best nice. Best report ever. Yes, no kidding. Okay, Dirk. Uh, I echo Stuart's, but just the first two. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, I don't have much either. Um, we did have the resort municipalities uh, mayor's call um, that we are still requesting the uh, meeting with the Minister of Tourism. We haven't gotten a response from her yet. That's Melanie Marks waiting on that. Um, I went to my last Tourism Roslyn board meeting because now Chris has stepped in there and I filmed my portion of the OCP video, but it's going to have to be reshot. I forgot some stuff, I think, to say. So um, have any of any of the rest of you done that yet? Have you started? All right. Good, good, good. OK. OK. And that is it. With that, we will have a uh, motion to adjourn and we're all good. Great. All right. Everybody out. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Right, thank you.